Good morning, everyone. Welcome morning. Uh, to the May morning. 21st uh, Joint Authority and Canal uh, Board meeting. We're happy to uh, have all of you uh, participating again this morning. I'm John Colmel, uh, Chair of the Board. <clears throat> we have uh, close to a full squad turnout uh, this morning with me. Our fellow trustees, uh, Gina Candry, Ann Crest, Dennis Trainer, Tracy McKibben, Mike Balboni. Unfortunately, Trustee Pacente was uh, unable to join today. As always, uh, we have Gil and uh, his team and staff uh, from NIFA, NIPA uh, on board uh, as well. And with that, I'm uh, pleased to call our meeting uh, to order. As always, uh, we start with uh, the adoption of our meeting agenda, which we've all had a chance to review. Uh, the one late-breaking uh, change to that agenda is items 4. Uh, in 4A, uh, two EDPAB board uh, resolutions that uh, were expected to be uh, brought forward uh, were unable to do so, given that uh, yesterday's meeting was uh, postponed. So we'll pick those uh, back up in July. Other than that, unless uh, anyone has any uh, additional amendments to the agenda, I'd ask for a motion to approve our agenda as presented. So moved. So moved. Uh, I heard a second as well as a motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, uh, the agenda uh, has been approved. Uh, typically, uh, again this morning, we will start uh, an executive uh, session and then uh, resume uh, in an hour or so in open session. With that, I'd ask for a motion to conduct an executive session to discuss the financial and credit history of our corporation and matters leading to the appoint, appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person uh, or corporation pursuant to Section 105 of the Public Officer's Law. Motion, please. So, so moved. So moved. All right. Uh, there's at least a second uh, in there. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. We will adjourn to executive session. Thanks very much. Hi, welcome back, everyone. It's not just here. Joe's I think uh, we're ready uh, to resume, so appreciate everyone's uh, patience. Uh, and uh, we're now ready to uh, resume in. Uh, open session. In fact, if I could have a motion uh, to do so, uh, I'd appreciate that. So moved. So moved. Uh, second. The second. Uh, thanks, Michael. Dennis, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Um, as always, uh, we've uh, provided indications of any conflicts uh, that we've had. I'll assume um, that there's no other additions or changes that any of us need to provide there. All right, with that assumption in place, uh, we've uh, obviously uh, all received uh, the information in advance of the session. Uh, the consent agenda in particular uh, has uh, you know, numerous uh, items, uh, some of which fall under housekeeping, some of which uh, uh, are, are a little more notable. But uh, uh, unless anyone has uh, issues, questions, or concerns, uh, I'd ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented to us. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, and there's a second in there. Again, no questions or comments. Otherwise, all in favor uh, in support of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda carries. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we'll uh, start uh, the, the the meeting with a uh, presentation from uh, Gil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Board of Trustees, colleagues, and the public. Um, as uh, customary, I start with our corporate performance uh, scorecard. The red here is really a timing issue. Uh, in fact, this scorecard is uh, a measurement up to March 2019, and for our greenhouse gas uh, reduction under our energy services business line for April, we actually met the goal, and uh, we are confident by the end of the year that we should be green and on the right spot. 
So good news. So our greenhouse right gases are green now. <laughs> <laughs> our indicator. Um, there will be three items that you will hear today in, in our board meeting, uh, in the public session of our board meeting, and I just want to give uh, a highlight uh, on on each one of them before we have more extensive discussions uh, presented by staff. First is the successful relicensing of our Blenheim Gilboa pump storage power project. This is another 50 year license. Uh, this process takes about five to six, five to six years to, to uh, apply for relicensing uh, go through that process with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I'd like to um, just give kudos to the team that led this under Justin's leadership, Mark Slade, Rob Daly, uh, who are, you're going to hear from uh, Mark uh, later today, and, and the entire team from the various business units who uh, managed this process. Excellent, excellent work. So we have this 50-year license, and you will hear more about it. Uh, from the team. Second is a great news for us. Uh, the, if you recall a few years ago, the New York ISO, our grid operator in our state, issued an RFP for transmission projects to bring more power from upstate New York to downstate New York, the load centers, and to uh, unclog congestions uh, along the way. Uh, this really came about from uh, Governor Cuomo's Energy Highway Blueprint, which was issued in October 2012. NIPA was a co-lead of that uh, task force that put that blueprint together for the state. And as you can see on this map, of the major projects uh, either built or being built since 2012, four of the eight are NIPA projects from our um, you know, our PV20, which is the line that connects to Vermont under Lake Champlain, which we completed. Uh, the Moses Willis Tower separation project, that's completed too. We're in the process, the design and planning process and Art Article 7 permitting process for Moses Adirondack, 85 mile of transmission. And a few years back, I, I neglected to mention Marcy South Series compensation, which is kind of on the bottom. Those have been NIPA's project and really unprecedented investment in the transmission system uh, for decades. So the investments that, that we are making and others are making, you know, you see Con Edison here, you see Next Era, so there are utilities and, and private developers and NIPA investing in transmission. The amount of investment being done after the Energy Highway Blueprint was put together has been unprecedented compared to, I would say, three decades before that. So there's a lot of project, and it reflects in our capital budget. As you, if you recall, in December, you approve our four-year plan. Our capital budget, which is normally in the $450 million a year range, will be going up to a billion dollars. So it's really a major investment in infrastructure in New York State to bring more renewable energy areas to the load centers. And you'll hear the first request for funding to commence that project. Our, we call it the segment A of the New York ISO AC transmission proceeding. We also uh, have been working hard on reimagining the canals. You'll hear an update today. Uh, we opened the season last week. We also announced the uh, standing up of a task force to really push forward the reimagination of the canals and to in include the community and uh, their <coughs> input into that process. So we're excited about uh, the canals. Now, now it's open. We had a special event last uh, week also when we opened this season. We named one of our tugboats after Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a pioneer in uh, women's ability to vote in Seneca Falls. Uh, we're reminded that next year will be the 100th uh, anniversary 
of the 19th Amendment. So it's, uh, that was a great event last week, and uh, you'll hear more about the progress and where we are in terms of the canals. That's my report. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anything for Gil? All right. Thank uh, you. Thanks very much, Gil. Uh, next up, uh, Lee uh, with uh, our financial uh, update. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, trustees. Good morning, uh, members of the public and fellow colleagues. This is, I'll provide you with our standard update on what our year to date performance and what our expected year end performance is for uh, 2019. Uh, let me start out by saying that um, the takeaway here again, I'm glad to report, is that uh, through the first quarter of this year and through the balance of the year, we expect uh, to uh, be above budget on a net income basis. Uh, these results are being primarily driven and continue to be driven by increased uh, hydro flows and hydro generation. So moving on to year-to-date performance through the first quarter end in March, what you'll wind up seeing here is um, starting with margin generations and addressing some of the larger variances. Um, we, gen we expect this year to uh, come in um, 11 million, a little over $11 million above budget. Uh, this is primarily being uh, driven by lower operating expenses associated with some of the work that we're doing at Niagara and Canals. Uh, that has been uh, shifted towards the back end of the year. This is a timing difference that we expect yeah, will, will reverse itself over the course of the year. Uh, the other variance I'll address uh, through March is our uh, generation margins. Um, we're below budget in that regard as a result of lower power prices that we've seen um, over the, the tail end of the winter there. Uh, I think what you'll wind up seeing when I show you the full year performance, we expect these uh, negative variances to fully reverse and go into uh, positive territory. So let me, let me move to that right now. Uh, so for the full year 2019, we are expecting to be uh, on the order of $20 million above budget. Um, that is primarily being driven uh, by positive variances that we're seeing in margin generation uh, associated with high, higher hydro generation and higher hydro flows, which have more than offset uh, the softness and the power prices that we've seen. Uh, transmission margins and non-utility margins largely uh, on budget. Uh, operating expenses right now largely on budget again. And interest expenses slightly better than budget, uh, primarily attributable to uh, postponements and issues that we had scheduled for the first quarter of this year, but are expecting to, to occur later on in the year. Uh, so with that uh, and with this brief summary of, of update through first quarter and uh, through full for a year, I'd be glad to take any questions if there are any. Let me just clarify again, Lee. Um, so all of the trends in the first three months of the year, <clears throat> you expect to reverse um, over the next nine months. Um, yes, that's correct. Uh, and, I, and I'll be more specific about that. We, we expect to see continued softness in power prices, but trends in our overall generation, primarily around our hydro generation at our large hydro facilities, Niagara and St. Lawrence, is, will be the driver of the reversal in generation margins, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, well, the net of all that's been good news year to date. Uh, do you expect it to be even better news uh, over the course of the full year? That is correct. Okay. Lee, uh, Gene Nicandri here. Can, can we assume that part of the, the increase in generation margins <clears throat> in part has to do with, in the past, making capital investments and life extension at these two uh, huge generating facilities that the authority operates, that we're seeing some of the results of making that investment resulting in higher margins in 2019 going forward. That's, that's, a, that's a very uh, 
a, a student strong operational takeaway and what the ultimate financial impacts of that are. It's, it is key for us, I'll, I'll reemphasize I'll emphasize this from a financial perspective, to continue to make the types of investments that maintain reliability of, and availability of our core gen, both generation and transmission infrastructure so that when we have an opportunity, we can make sure that we're in the market and that we're utilizing the assets as, as, uh, as they economically should be, be done. And that Gil, all that I, makes I, me think, um, in terms of uh, the uh, late winter season and high water levels, uh, Lake Ontario in particular and uh, the like, uh, no onerous impacts uh, on us from any of that, uh, whether it be financially, obviously, Lee, Hydro, you just said key driver, but Gil, operationally and otherwise, um, uh, no harm, no foul in terms of our end of what continues to be uh, a meaningful challenge uh, managing those water levels. No significant impact in our uh, generation of power. You know, we are helping the state with our other resources to, uh, you know, in our Department of uh, Emergency Services specifically to help those communities with our assets, like bringing sandbags and, and other type of resources to mitigate flooding in targeted areas. But in terms of our business of generating power, no significant impact. Okay. Uh, unless there's anything else for Lee, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, the good work. Uh, Joe Kessler. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, trustees, uh, staff, and the public. Um, as you can see for the utility operations report, uh, our metrics are uh, trending in a good direction right now. Even the safety metric, which is uh, yellow, is trending in the right direction. That's just the conventional uh, early year uh, denominator being light with the number of hours worked. Uh, and we hope that's going to be green for next uh, report. Um, we have two items for the, uh, the board to uh, approve. Um, there are separate items regarding uh, AC transmission proceedings and then some support work we need for the canals. So Gil uh, did the uh, spoiler for me on, the, on what the project is and that we're, we're here to uh, present. So today the trustees are requested to authorize the funding of up to $28.1 million for phase one of the AC transmission proceeding project. On April 8, 2019, the New York ISO Board of Directors approved the recommendation in the AC transmission public policy transmission planning report and selected the authority and North American Transmission's joint transmission proposal for what they call segment A. The scope of the pro uh, work includes about 100 miles of transmission line upgrades, two new switch yards, and system upgrades to lines and stations owned by other utilities. Phase one funding for the project includes support for permitting, including New York State Public Service Law Article uh, 7 application, engineering design, property rights acquisition, interconnection development costs, and system upgrades. And the permitting and engineering is anticipated to begin uh, at the beginning of 2021, and the current expected in-service date of this project is going to be in 2023, so pretty fast-paced. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm open to any questions and uh, hoping for an approval on this. Just to be clear, the 28.1, is that the total cost expectation, or is that 28.1 million of uh, larger? It, 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 it represents about 10% of the overall budget of what we're going to be expected to come to for the board over the process of the uh, entire project. The entire project being the next four years, you said, Joe? Yeah, over the next four years. The, the services part of it, the engineering design, this is, represents that value. There will be uh, acquisition of materials costs, labor, and, and uh, construction costs uh, going forward. That will be an amount closer to $280 million. So it's a $300 million project. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Um, you otherwise, you I need a motion, motion on it. I All right. So uh, moved. Can I ask a quick question? Oh. I'm sorry. Hi, it's Anne. 
I think it would be interesting at some point if we were able to see the indirect value to New York State of some of these projects because every time we do one of these authorizations, it, it doesn't just benefit NIPA and NIPA's operations, but we're hiring people, um, you're creating secondary employment opportunities, and, and so it might be interesting at some point to see an assessment of what the value add to the economy overall is from some of these projects. We'll definitely follow up on that. We'll uh, we'll provide an update to the board in a future meeting for that. Yeah, that's a good idea because there are reliability benefits, there are um, electricity cost benefits to all New Yorkers. Right. Aside from the uh, jobs and construction jobs, et cetera, we we should include that in the future. And just to to be clear, the three hundred million uh, investment that is our part is. 37 and a half percent of the entire project. Our partner, uh, North American Transmission or LS Power, they uh, they will invest the the other portion. You know, hundred. So it's a billion dollar. Thirty-seven and a half. Yep. Correct. Yeah, it's closer. Yeah, it's closer to seven hundred uh, million dollars overall. Okay. So we will follow right. up on that uh, other item. Appreciate the comments. Uh, judge uh, has made a motion. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. Thanks, Michael Dennis. Uh, all in favor, I say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Uh, terrific. All right, Joe, uh, in oh. terms of uh, canal support. Right. So for canal support, um, the New York Canal Corporation is spending about $10 million per year for engineering construction management services. We do that through contract support. Uh, we did solicit that this year and um, are asking for approval of those contracts. The trustees are requested to authorize funding of $30 million in total. This amount consists of two $15 million uh, contracts, one for engineering services specifically and the other for construction management services. Uh, both will be spent over the period of the next three years. Is this part of the canal budget? Yes, this would be part of the regular recurring uh, canal budget. But it's not it's not part of the you know the 21 million or the 80 you know 6 million it's incremental to that, right? That's correct. Okay. And this does this is for what again, Joe? Is this new services? These are continuing services? No, we rely on these are continuing services. We rely on these engineering services to manage the large capital and uh, non-recurring work that goes on at Canal. So these are uh, engineering firms and such that would help us uh, uh, monitor the large-scale projects uh, that are going on at Canals. Got it. So this I'm is sorry, part of our question. all Just to in make sure I understand. Sorry, I w it wasn't clear. So this ten million is on top of the eighty-six million we approved. In December, right. correct. It's not. No, it's not. It's this is part of the budget. This is the operating. This is the consulting services and construction okay. services associated with the eighty-six million. So I'm sorry if we I misspoke there. Great. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, so I thought the all-in cost for uh, canals was north of a hundred million. I thought this was another piece of that. No. No, this is part of that. This is part of the 86 uh, O&M and the roughly 40 million in capital work that we have going on at Canals overall. Annually, okay. over a three year period. And these are, these are limits. So these are contracts up to those limits in support of that work. They're on call services. Okay. With the benefit of all that clarity or not, uh, if I could have a motion to uh, approve uh, the ten million uh, per year so for engineering and construction management services. So moved. Second. All right. Terrific. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, all in favor, aye. 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 <coughs> any opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Thank thanks very much, Thank Joe. My report. All right, uh, Sarah. Sorry, you're probably already in route. All right, good morning, uh, Chairman, committee members, the public. I'm here to share with you the results year to date of our commercial operations group. Uh, 
in March, actually, we, we did well relative to our targets uh, and uh, met uh, the gross margin that we had anticipated, which was $27 million. <clears throat> However, due to the performance in January and February, you're still seeing the results of that in the year-to-date figures. Specifically, electricity prices were more depressed than we anticipated when we set the budget. This was largely due to the more temperate winter, which was seven degrees warmer than anticipated. The electricity prices are typically in that time period reflecting oil, higher cost fuels, because natural gas is reserved for residential consumers. And so even though we have significantly or relatively higher generation from our hydro facilities in the first quarter, it was not able to offset the depressed, the lower than anticipated electricity prices. On, 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 uh, in, in terms of the full year forecast, as Lee articulated, we expect to uh, meet our budget. That is due to, again, to the expected increase in generation, the fact that energy prices and electricity prices should be in line with what we anticipated, and also, too, because we, as part of our hedging program and our risk management program, have enacted hedges in order to reduce the band of uncertainty around our, our full-year gross margin. So, again, we anticipate that we will be uh, meeting our, our $327 million gross margin budget for the year. We continue to support the economic growth and competitiveness of New York State, working closely with our stakeholders, the economic uh, development boards of the different regions, Empire State Development Corporation, in terms of allocating our low-cost hydropower, as well as in, in attracting additional CNI customers. The team is very focused on that, and hopefully in the balance of the year we'll have some opportunities to share some news with you there. On energy efficiency, Again, in, in looking at uh, improving uh, operations there, we're accelerating the customer investments, which entail accelerate the fees and the revenues that we receive from those businesses. As you can see, we're well, well ahead of what we anticipated to be this year uh, to date. Our operating expenses are above uh, the budget for year to date. However, that will be reversed by the end of the year. These were some timing issues as well as some one-time non-recurring costs. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, or if you do. Any questions uh, for Sarah? No questions. Okay. Thanks very much, Sarah. Appreciate it. Good work. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, we have uh, a request to uh, further invest in our IT uh, infrastructure. Uh, Rob. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman, trustees, and the NIPA leadership and our public stakeholders. I'm here today to seek the board's approval for funding of critical digital infrastructure, what we're also calling compute and storage platform. So just as a little bit of background, there's really three principal business drivers for the request. One is for the continued acceleration of NIPA's cybersecurity uh, protection and strategy, and it's really to protect our technology assets and our intellectual property. Two is required refresh of our existing technologies, such as core processors and disk storage, that are at end of technology life. In other words, that will no longer or soon no longer be supported by our technology vendors and manufacturers. And thirdly, is really the need for critical capacity to support accelerated business activity. You hear a lot about that in moonshots and acceleration of sensor deployment, et cetera, and the significant growth that's associated with that over the next five years. So let me give you a few examples. Active cyber monitoring. We continue to ramp up and look at, at the, the active monitoring. Sensor deployment, which has increased nearly five times. The asset performance management, use of our drone technologies and video capture associated with that. 3D modeling, advanced analytics. You hear about... Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics. All of these things are extremely compute and storage intensive. To give an idea of the volume, we're talking about a 330 percent increase, increase in storage and over a 400 percent increase in the computing capacity that's required to support these initiatives. So with that said, 
to really assure the availability of the essential capacity and to support the accelerated business demand, we need to implement this compute and storage technology in an accelerated manner. And we're saying in one year versus over an incremental five years. To look at the cost side of things, and besides realizing the benefits, both of the operating benefits and the risk reduction, the accelerated one-year implementation will result in a $14 million savings in both operational expense and capital expense. So essentially, that's the difference between a $34 million in a one-year implementation versus the $48 million with a five-year implementation. The net difference is $29 million savings over the five years. The major benefits are listed here, but if you look at it from an increased cyber protection, clearly, some of the underlying technologies like software-defined networks and micro-segmentation, while they might sound very techy, are really critical in, or in order to meet some of the objectives and some of the other benefits. The critical capacity to support the business demand is essential to be able to provision that when is required so as not to be dis disruptive to the business and the expectations. Significant reduction, as I mentioned before, in the OPEX and CAPEX. And something that people don't necessarily appreciate is the reduction in the, the coexistence, the IT infrastructure complexity. When you have a mixed bag of technology, of new and old technology, it's very difficult from an inter interoperability and compatibility. So getting to a common set of technology uh, simplifies the environment and makes it less complex and more stable. And then lastly, there are numerous operating benefits and efficiencies, including faster and easier service provisioning and scalability. So when you're talking about the infrastructure at the scale at which we're ramping up, it's important for us to get ahead of that and be able to manage that on an ongoing basis. So with that said and with the background, I formally request the approval for the contract award and the funding authorization to be able to act on this capital request. So, Mr. Chairman, if I uh, may uh, speak in support of this. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, sure, Mike. Okay. So, um, our, one of our biggest initiatives of the authority is obviously the end-to-end the, and the digitization. That drives tremendous amounts of data, and, and that's really what it's all about. And what's happening now in the, both the cybersecurity area um, and what's happening now in storage is that there is this convergence and recognition that in order to operate safely throughout all the different permutations of, of data utilization, you have to have a convergence of a storage capability plus a security capability. Right. And so what Joe has outlined is this essential need to understand that as we get more information, we have to be able to put it in a place that we can access it, that it can be secure, and we need to do it quickly. The, this the threat landscape as it relates to cybersecurity and data is changing dramatically. Just yesterday, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency in Washington, D.C. issued an alert about the utilization of foreign manufactured drones, specifically as it related to the hijacking of the data um, telecommunication within that drone communications. And so if we are not taking a look at our legacy programs that provide the vulnerabilities that you saw in the WannaCry attacks, mm -hmm. and if we are not streamlining and accessing our architecture, our data architecture for storage, then we are creating more vulnerability as we get more and more data. The, the last piece that I want to uh, tell you is that I really support the architecture that Joe has outlined. We had a, a nice call about this um, yesterday. It's and Joe's brother, he, Rob. That's I'm sorry, Rob. Rob. Sorry, I keep saying Joe. I knew what you meant. Yeah. Um, it's his brother. They're twin brothers. Exactly. Right. And Casey was They're there. They're easy to confuse. Casey Carnes was there as well. Um, the architecture that they have outlined is going to allow the authority to move forward, not just this year, but in future years, to be able to scale and the utilization of the data. So I fully support this. I fully support the uh, truncated time period for the implementation of this and its costs. Thank you for that. So one question that I had, and I and I get, and I sort of sort of understand the complexities around um, cybersecurity and its application, particularly for utilities. 
but it wasn't clear to me if what you're asking for, because you call it, you term it as a platform, are we doing an assessment of our technology infrastructure to assess any vulnerabilities, or are we overlaying a new software program throughout the enterprise to integrate um, you know, their different um, areas that are operating here? It wasn't clear to me, are we launching some whole new enterprise software system that needs to integrate systems and so that's not what we're doing. No, and, and perhaps the, the use of the word platform is misleading. But fundamentally, we're refreshing the technology. So this is the hardware and the associated software that goes with that. So we'll get, we're getting new refresh technology that is very efficient and very uh, energy efficient as well and a smaller footprint. What, what we're doing and the big difference is with that hardware and with the related software to be able to implement what I refer to as this micro-segmentation, some of the sort of techie talk, allows us to use that hardware instead of in little groups. So now we can dynamically use that, those resources in a much more efficient manner. At the same time with what Trustee Balboni just talked about is the software that is part of this, and it's not just an application, it's part of what we call an environment, allows us to segment, basically slice it up in smaller pieces so that you can limit the liability or the risk associated with attacks or vulnerabilities. So it's really uh, a combination of physical hardware, software that you use to be able to access that hardware, both servers and storage, but also how you administer, which is more the operational efficiency element that I was talking about. Being able to say, hey, if I need to redeploy some, uh, some of the capacity to support a moonshot or a sensor deployment, I can do that very dynamically, but in a very consistent and a very safe manner. So it's not just, it's not a software application, it's really a combination. Okay, so it'll sit on top of the systems that you currently <laughs> Yes. Okay. And when you talk happen? about it, sorry, Rob. No worries. When you talk about an accelerated investment, as uh, we chatted about it, my takeaway was, uh, while the, it's economically prudent, um, it's functionally all the more necessary because we're playing a little bit of catch up and we need to ensure we've got a solid foundation and the, and the capacity uh, to scale the business uh, in, in, the, in the fashion that we anticipate with the moonshots and uh, otherwise uh, the many of the significant investments that I hear you <coughs> correctly when, when we chatted. So while accelerated benefits, for, you know, financially, it's really you know, much more important that we move with pace here uh, to ensure we've got the infrastructure and the capacity we need. That's exactly right, and I, I would argue the the savings is secondary uh, relative to the right. utility and the benefit, and again, around the risk and operational benefits, and the ability to work in an agile fashion in line with our business commitments. So that's ex exa exactly right. We're just very fortunate we get an economic benefit beyond the necessary functionality that we need. And my final comment here, and Trustee Balboa, and I'll let you go, but um, we need to get ahead of the curve. The rate at which we're deploying new capabilities and the data acquisition and the increased risks externally requires to jump in. We have to do this, in my opinion. I feel, and I feel that the underlying architecture, the investment we've made in acquiring the right SMEs to do the proper due diligence in designing the underlying architecture and the technologies that's associated with it will allow us to cover all those bases. So it's not just simply, hey, we're going to refresh technology, which is why I wanted to say there are many facets of this. But in order to deploy this and implement it, it has to happen concurrently. And that's the challenge. And being able to rapidly do that so that, hey, we got to get off these antiquated or the, uh, our old systems in the process as we then deploy. So there's a lot of work here. But we're positioned to make this happen. And I feel with the open architecture and the, the architecture we have, we can do this in a very deliberate, non-destructive manner and still meet the, the business obligations and the requirements. So, Chairman, thank you. All I right. appreciate your comments very much. Just one, one last comment. Unless so, there's any other questions, yeah. I'd ask for a motion to approve uh, Joe's proposal. Some Some of them. <laughs> we have a second. Second. I think there was a second in there. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, motion carried. Joe, thanks very much. Say hello to Rob. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chairman and Trustees. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Mark. Necessary. Mark, back to uh, as Gil talked about uh, relicensing at uh, Blenheim Gelpoa. Mark Slade, thank you right. for joining us. How's your brother, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one way. Okay, well, we're getting closer. Um, good morning. I'm Mark Slade. I'm the director of hydro licensing. Uh, what we're presenting here this morning is uh, more in the way of a ratification of a mission accomplished than some of the other items that are put before you. About, uh, it's actually about seven or eight years ago, we first talked to the board about starting this process. And at that time, we set ourselves a stretch goal of trying to get a new 50-year license with no significant operational restrictions. And on April 30th, the Federal Energy Commission granted a new license which achieved that goal. Um, at this point, I would like to recognize and back there, um, he has been the licensing manager throughout the entire process. He has done a wonderful job of managing the process and maintaining a meticulous record. Um, he was the guy who took all the guff from the public when this process started, and there always is. You, you, you don't attract your friends. <laughs> um, and Rob did a wonderful job and actually uh, demonstrated um, uh, a whole new world for me of, uh, of uh, personal relationship management in achieving some relationships that ultimately turned out to be absolutely critical to achieving this settlement. Um, we're here today to ask you to accept this new license and to authorize $37.1 million to fund the settlement over f the course of 50 years. Um, staff and NIPA Legal, as well as our consultant team and outside counsel, have reviewed the new license and agree that it's consistent with the settlement agreements we've entered into. Um, this settlement is very much in keeping with the, um, the revenue from this project. It is not another mega settlement that we associate with some of the other larger hydro projects. We had to keep it scaled back to a level that the project could support. We did that. Um, the settlement amount, I know it's still a large number, but it is actually a tiny fraction of what we deal with at the other projects. We are, um, we're, we're, I'm very hopeful that BG will see better days. It's, it's economics have been marginal, but I am hopeful that as the emphasis on energy storage and renewables uh, becomes uh, more prominent, that uh, people will recognize that BG really is the largest, most proven, and most reliable energy storage unit in New York for now in the foreseeable future. Um, with that, I'd take any questions. Uh, just in closing, I would note that with the completion of this relicensing process, all three of NIPA's large hydros have now received new licenses with new 50-year licenses, and actually none of them contained any significant new operational restrictions. Our situation is a little unique. I can only take credit for a small part of that. I understand that. But at the same time, it's a remarkable accomplishment that's been achieved by my, by my team and others over the years. Kudos to you and all involved, uh, Mark. Um, I agree it uh, puts us in a great spot, uh, you know, pushing forward. So. Uh, very, very well uh, done, and take all the credit you can. Um, <laughs> with that, um, unless there's, there are any questions for Mark, I'd ask for a motion to adopt uh, the resolution. So moved. And there's a second included as well. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Again, Mark, congratulations uh, to you, Rob, and Joe, and everybody else involved. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. All right. Um, we uh, had a couple uh, committee meeting uh, committee meetings earlier uh, this morning to start our day, uh, <clears throat> both uh, finance and governance. And uh, first up to uh, present the outcomes of our finance committee report is uh, its chair uh, Tracy McKibben. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the committee met this morning and we received an update from our Chief Operating Officer, Joe Kessler, and our Acting Chief Financial Officer, Lee Garza, on the large capital projects being undertaken by the authority. Uh, the update they provided us covered the 10 capital projects uh, by the investment amount that, we, that the authority is um, pursuing, as well as the financial impacts 
uh, associated with the future investment of, in a transmission project. That's the AC transmission project, which you've just heard about, that was recently awarded to the authority by the New York um, ISO. The ten projects covered the management's uh, reports. Uh, the ten covered project. The ten projects that were covered are multi-year investments that the authority is making, um, and and the authority is expected to invest approximately three point five billion dollars total. Uh, One point six billion uh, of that uh, was previously approved by, by the board. Uh, the committee also adopted minutes and a motion to recommend the release of funds to the Canal Corporation as part of our regularly uh, quarterly uh, releases. Uh, this item is now uh, before the full board for a vote. Um, thanks very much, uh, Tracy. So uh, we need uh, approval from the full board of the committee's recommendation to release uh, the next quarterly installment to uh, uh, Canals Corp. I'll take uh, Tracy's uh, report out as a motion. If I could have a second to to that, please. Second. Second. Thanks, Des. Uh, unless there's any other questions of uh, Tracy, all in favor of the release of the funds to uh, Canal Corp. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> aye. Motion carried. Thanks Great. very much, um, uh, Tracy for your time, leadership, and uh, report out. Uh, next up, uh, Ann Kress, uh, Governance Committee Chair. The committee met briefly this morning to consider the appointment of Sandeep Thakur as controller of the Authority and Canal Corporation at an annual salary of 200000 effective immediately, and the committee adopted a motion to make this recommendation to the full board. The board is now asked to vote, vote on that appointment. So uh, move. Motion. Uh, I'll take Ann's as a motion. Uh, judge as a second. Um, we're excited and pleased to have uh, Sandeep uh, join uh, the team. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Sandeep, I'm drinking my uh, Diet Cherry Pepsi in recognition of uh, your now joining us. So, uh, kudos, congratulations, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, thanks very much, Ann. I appreciate that. Our last uh, agenda item is uh, an update report on uh, the Reimagine the Canals uh, initiative, uh, one which uh, we're very excited to uh, be undertaking and even more excited uh, in anticipation of uh, some incredibly positive outcomes. Uh, Kim Harriman uh, will give us uh, a, a drive-by, please. Good morning, Chairman and Trustees. Thank you for having me. Um, today I'm here to give you an update on the Reimagine the Canals competition. And before I do that, let's do a little bit of a walk through history. As you may recall, in 2017, uh, the New York Power Authority assumed operation and ownership of the New York State Canal System. Shortly after that turnover of control, we launched a Reimagine the Canals design competition. And the competition was designed to take a 200-year-old asset and think about what does the next 100 years look like for this iconic asset. Uh, with that, we announced the winners in October of 2018. Um, just for a, a walk down history lane, we had 145 applications from nine countries. So folks from around the world were energized about the iconic canal system and came with some unbelievable ideas. One of those ideas that won is the Erie Armada. This is a competition, a festival that will take place coming uh, September of 2019 in the Finger Lakes region. Um, it is designed to not only celebrate the history of the canal, but also to reinforce the recreational purpose of the canal and to recognize the craft breweries that we have all along the spine of the canal. Um, I can commit that the, uh, the material that will be used for these vessels as they compete will not be consumed on site, um, but will be uh, accumulated over a longer period of time, uh, but purposed, as you can see in this image, um, to allow for a boat race. But it's not just about the boat race. There'll be an immersive festival experience that'll go along it. Um, and it's really designed to bring in an age group that probably has not been on the canal before and to track those millennials um, who are very much a part of both recreational boating as well as craft breweries these days. 
The second uh, winner in the competition is the Canal Side Pocket Neighborhoods. This is an innovative living adaptive use along the canal spearheaded by the Madison County Planning Department. Their idea uh, isn't isn't new in the sense of pocket living, but new in the sense of taking a canal asset, sometimes with periods uh, or spans of property that are underutilized or not used at all, and converting them into livable communities. Um, the aspects of this include uh, the pocket neighborhood guidelines and book, and that's going to be developed by the planning department as it moves through the planning stages, the contracting stages, the construction, and then the habitation stage. So that way it actually ends up being what I would call a living laboratory. So people can learn, developers can learn about how this was established, how it works, some of the lessons that were learned along the way, because we want these ideas to be replicable across the 324 miles of the Erie Canal spine. Um, so this group will have a developer RFP issued and selected um, by the end of 2019. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to you with some groundbreaking uh, when we find the site and they're ready to commence with construction. So one of the things is that 145 applications came in and we can only pick two winners. That was the way the competition was constructed. Um, but I think all of us realized there were so many great ideas that we couldn't select, but had real possibility. Um, and so last Friday, as Gil mentioned in his opening uh, presentation, May 17th, the governor announced the Reimagine the Erie Canal Task Force. And this group um, is designed to look at and to promote economic development, recreation, and resiliency, starting with, but not limited to, all the proposals, the 145 from nine countries that we got during the Reimagine the Canal competition. The governor has given this task force specific focus on looking at the infrastructure of the canals, as we talked about, it's a 300 mile Erie Canal spine with significant water control infrastructure along that spine. So the governor's focus has, for the task force is to look at that infrastructure and how it can mitigate impacts from flooding and ice jams, such as those that occur in the Mohawk communities, to evaluate how we can better promote economic development opportunities along this unbelievable waterway. Uh, as well as looking at the restoration of natural ecosystems. Um, the canal runs along several major rivers and tributaries, um, and it's in, a, in its construction, those were altered. So looking at the canal and how it can actually use, be used for natural restoration is a, an area of focus for the task force, uh, as well as irrigation in Western New York. For those of us who come from Western New York, we know about the farming communities out there. We know about the 2016 drought that occurred um, and the impact, significant financial impact to farmers as a result of it. So using that robust infrastructure, waterway infrastructure, to look at how that could help for irrigation for those farming communities. As well as looking at all these infrastructures, some of them are 100, 150 years old, and looking at how we can adaptively reuse um, that legacy infrastructure to get to those goals of economic development, recreation, and resiliency. So that's the focus and the charge that the governor has given the task force. That equates to really three things. One is that the task force members will oversee technical analysis and plan development. So bringing in the best of the experts in each of these areas to give us their best thinking. The second is to reaching out to the community and to stakeholders to engage them on their ideas, um, their perspective. When you think about it, almost two million people live along the Erie Canal spine. So that's a lot of individuals who um, oftentimes believe it is their canal, it is in their backyard. And so we wanna make sure that there's a robust engagement with them. And lastly, the task force convenings themselves, which is to take the, the technical analysis and the plan, as well as that outreach, and digest that and assemble that ultimately into a plan or what I would like to call the strategic plan, right? And the vision for the reimagine the canals. Um, so it's a lot of work, uh, but we have a great technical, I would say great task force to help us out along the way. Um, this last slide is really focused on the membership of the task force and the structure of the task force. Um, first, what we realized in looking at those ideas that came in in the competition and as we did more due diligence into the asset itself, is that the canal is really, in, and the spine of the Erie Canal, is really three regions, the western, the central, and the Mohawk. And each of these regions 
um, have a unique relationship with and it can get an opportunity from the canals. So to that end, we looked for the best leaders and thought leaders in those regions, and we came up with a fantastic um, set of leaders. First, Robert Duffy, um, who is the former Lieutenant Governor, former Rochester Mayor, and current President and CEO of the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce, has agreed to be the co-chair for the Western Regional Subcommittee of the Task Force. Um, Joni Mahoney, our former County Executive, Vonnegutta County, former Board Chair of NIPA, uh, and uh, the COO currently of SUNY College of ESF. Uh, will be the central co-chair, but also will be the super, I call it the super chair of the entire task force itself. And Joe Martens, who's the director of the New York Offshore Wind Alliance and our former DEC commissioner, will head up the regional um, subcommittee for the Mohawk Valley. Um, with these three uh, leaders, there will be a establishment of a task force membership that really comes from a variety of disciplines that um, will be impacted or could find opportunity um, as we vision the strategic plan for the canal. And those will include maritime recreation experts, agricultural, environmental, historic preservation, economic development. So we'll have a membership um, at large from those disciplines as well as official members from state agencies such as DEC and parks, uh, the Parks uh, Commission and in other state agencies and authorities as we move along. So we're excited for this to start. Um, we feel like it's been a long time coming, but it's gonna be fantastic, and I can't wait to come back and tell you more as we move through the process. I'll take any questions you may have. Talk a little bit about time, a minute on timeline. Uh, Kim, where would we expect to be uh, later this year? Uh, where would we expect to be by this time next year? Yeah, so I think because the um, we're not starting from of 145 ideas that came in that touched upon the variety of the topics I just talked about that were ahead of the game. Um, and the goal would be to come back before the end of the year with um, a vision and a, and a plan for the board's consideration. Great. Um, any other questions for Kim? I said, I know we've uh, you know, chatted about this on and off over the you know, last six to nine months. Uh, as a board, we're equally excited and enthused uh, to reimagine and reinvent uh, the canals so uh, but other thoughts questions for Kim all right well appreciate the update Kim thanks very much um, with, with that unless there's any other matters to come before us as a board uh, I'm uh, pleased to bring our meeting to a uh, our next uh, joint meeting uh, will be uh, at the end of July July 30th um again uh, we'll all convene uh, back in uh, white plains and with that um i'd ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting no move second Thank you, dennis uh, have a second in there somewhere i'm sure all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Opposed, uh, motion carried. Thanks very much, everyone, for your time and attention. Uh, kudos to all for the good work continuing to be done. Uh, enjoy the sunshine and uh, the first couple months of summer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a great you, day. Jim.